So what I'm going to talk about today is, oh, first, uh, traditional disclaimers. Uh, the contents of this presentation come from a, actually a real ongoing uh, clinical trial, but it's aggregate, uh, aggregate data. And just to make some of the numbers work out uh, nicely, I changed some of the numbers. So some of the numbers are fake. Um, so as a result, the bullet, my second bullet is this presentation is only about 95% plus or minus pi percent accurate. Um, <laughs> Um, for those of you uh, desiring a talk that's kind of more on the statistical and the operational side, I'm going to apologize. There are two slides that have formulas. Um, for those who are uh, looking for more of like Eric's style with a, a lot of Greek symbols, derivations, um, I have two slides. <laughs> so I got something for everyone. So before I go, here's kind of the agenda, kind of talk about abbreviations and acronyms. And the reason I was going to do that is because uh, this kind of, my therapeutic area is obesity, so this presentation has a lot of acronyms. So if I just start talking and you're not familiar with that, it just might not make any sense. So I thought I'd kind of spend a little time and define a couple terms. Uh, talk about some documents in designing a study uh, of this nature, the, the actual underlying study design. And um, the meat of the, the presentation is about how to predict uh, some different methods for predicting interim analyses. So this study that I'm going to talk about is a large study with uh, numerous uh, interim analyses and how to predict when those are, are going to occur. And so I'm going to kind of walk through four kind of different techniques that we used uh, using EAST, using simulation, another method. Uh, I call it the Cook method because I used his paper. Um, and the target 1.99 method. So just uh, bear with me. There's, there's 11 or 22 acronyms. I thought I'd quickly go through them. There won't be a quiz. Um, a lot of these, you're going to know what they are. Some of them are very specific to uh, cardiovascular type trials. Um, so I'll just quickly kind of go through them. Uh, ACS is acute coronary syndrome. Obviously, it has something to do with coronary issues. CI, confidence interval, cardiovascular. CVOT is a cardiovascular outcomes trial. Uh, CRF, everyone should know what that is. DMC, Data Monitoring Committee, everyone probably knows that. EDC, EOI is something that's a little bit different. This is an event of interest, and what I mean by that, it's a, it's a special category of serious adverse events. Um, there's another bullet on the slide where I call it TMQ, Targeted Medical Query. So if you hold on for about 11 more slides, I'll repeat what I just said. Um, Hazard ratio, HUSA is another uh, cardiovascular condition called hospitalization for unstable angina. IA is my abbreviation for inter interim analysis. MACE, um, anyone ever in the diabetes setting know what MACE, heard of MACE? So MACE is kind of this catch-all uh, composite endpoint for cardio, major cardiovascular um, events. Um, so it's kind of a, it's a term that's collectively referred to uh, uh, selection of cardiovascular serious adverse events. So I'm going to use MACE, the term MACE, uh, quite a bit throughout this uh, chat. Um, MI, my, uh, myocardial infarction, also known as a heart attack. Uh, NDA, new drug application. NI, non-inferiority. What else do I got in here? RCI, repeated confidence intervals. SAEs, everyone knows that, serious adverse events. SAP, everyone should know what that is. Anyone not know what SAP is? So I got 100% on the quiz if that's the, the question I choose. Uh, S-MACE is suspected major adverse cardio, uh, cardiovascular event. And TMQ is a targeted medical query. C, event of interest. It's a special category of serious adverse events. And last, VCAS. It's a, it's a system where um, serious adverse events get pushed into a system to get adjudicated. Um, and what I mean by adjudicate, I'll explain later on. But I thought I'll take a minute to kind of go through because for the rest of my 14 slides, they're covered with this. Um, so I thought I'd kind of explain them up front. All right. As a statistician uh, designing a trial like uh, the trial I'm going to talk about, you're very familiar with these documents as a statistician. Obviously, it starts with the protocol. Then the pro from the protocol, it goes down generally to the statistical analysis plan. This particular study, like most, or if not all, cardiovascular outcome trials have a DMC, which plays a huge role in the study. And then lastly, performance standards. Anyone involved with a DMC and has something 
performance standards. Anyone ever heard that term before? Or data ongoing data monitoring plan, anything like that? Data monitoring plan. So what this is, and it, this study um, had a performance standards document, you know, prepared by both the kind of the clinicians, the clinical operations uh, folks, the statistics group. Basically, what's a, it's a document. I'm just going to read what what the first paragraph of the document says. It's to ensure the integrity of the clinical trial, performance standards for subject enrollment, target patient population, appropriateness for treatment. And what I mean by that is, if a subject uh, is not the treatment isn't helping the subject, then they shouldn't be on the treatment. Um, adherence to study treatment: how long are our patients staying on on the treatment? Um, restricted concomitant medications and subject retention. Um, so during the course of the study, there's different phases during enrollment, during the course of the study, where these performance st uh, standards are assessed. So it's real data, it's aggregate data, but there are, going into the study, there's metrics that are set up that are agreed by the DMC, a lot of times the FDA, on what the study has to have to be successful, like you need 85% females. You need 25% of the people have to have type 2 diabetes, things like that. So it's kind of an ongoing um, collection of data. It's analyzed in an aggregate fashion. And so what happens is the study team basically meets on a regular basis. So when this study, in the early parts of the study, we would meet about things about enrollment. Are we enrolling the right patients? Are we enrolling them at the right rate. As the study progressed, it was more things like are patients who should be on, who shouldn't be on the medicine anymore, are they off? Um, are subjects taking restricted medications that they shouldn't take? Um, so we'd meet on a weekly basis to really make sure we're collecting the data um, correctly, we're getting the right population. And when we would go to DMC meetings, this was one of the core if not most of the time, the DMC would obviously assess the safety of the study. Uh, and if it was deemed the study was safe, a majority of the day would be, be spent on these performance standards. The DMC would say, you're not, you know, you're not uh, collecting, you're not cleaning your data fast enough. You're not getting enough subjects who have type 2 diabetes. You're not getting enough subjects who have cardiovascular disease. So we would get, you know, we would get, uh, held accountable uh, based on, on this document. Um, Tom Fleming just recently published a paper, I listed the reference there, where he actually describes in detail, it's a nice paper, he actually dis describes in detail this, this concept of performance standards. So it's a document that's a living document that goes along during the study on the collection and analysis of, of the appropriateness of your data to make sure the study is not only safe, but the, the integrity is good. So as a statistician, everyone, is generally aware of the first three. In this particular study, we had a kind of a fourth guiding document that we used. All right, so here's the actual study design. As I mentioned, this is actually an ongoing clinical trial uh, in, for the treatment of, of obesity. Um, the way the study design is set up, anyone work in the diabetes space? Anyone diabetes space? So this might be familiar to some people. It's kind of a two-phase study where the first phase of the study is for pre-market approval to get the drug approved, and then the back end of the study fulfills a post-marketing commitment. Um, so the way I've kind of listed it here is the first look is an administrative look just to see if you can submit your uh, interim data to the FDA and they'll evaluate the drug for approval, followed on the back end by a three-look uh, group sequential trial. Um, we use the O'Brien uh, spending function plug for EAST. We did use EAST to design this, this study. Um, it's a non-inferiority study, one-to-one uh, -one randomization, and we randomized about 13,000 patients uh, for the study. There's kind of a trickle-out effect to see, um, though there's a lead-in period where subjects have to be able to tolerate the, the drug, and then they get re-randomized. So when we re-randomized, we re-randomized uh, about 9,000 patients, which is a pretty big trial. Anyone done a trial? pretty much that big? It's pretty big. Um, we enrolled 13,000 patients in, in about six months. So we were enrolling about 1,600, 1,700 a, week, uh, a month. Um, very quick study to enroll. Um, the primary endpoint is uh, time to may. So it's a time to event. As I mentioned, it's a, it's a subject's time to when they, when they have a heart attack or a stroke 
or they or they die of a, a CV related uh, death. Um, so what happens in this study is we do an interim analysis and then we look at the hazard ratio. And if the hazard ratio, if the, if the competence interval for the hazard ratio, if the upper bound is less than 2.0 right here, the FDA would say you've met the criteria to submit your NDA and we'll consider your drug for approval while the study goes on. So this, this uh, compound, this drug, has a whole history of a phase three program. This is just a, a cardiovascular outcome trial that in the obesity space, the FDA makes uh, companies do a CVOT study as a post-marketing commitment. This just kind of allows you to do the, the front part of the study for one consideration and then the back end to, to fulfill a post-marketing study. So it's kind of an efficient way to use your patients uh, for, two, for two studies. So what happens is if the up, upper bound of the confidence interval is less than two, you can submit and then you, you follow on. I can say that this actually happened back in November of 2012. Uh, our confidence interval ruled out two, so we submitted to the FDA. Our NDA, six months later, that's actually seven months later, the FDA approved the drug um, based on this data, interim data. The study is continuing on. We have another interim coming up uh, later on uh, this month. So it uh, kind of plays out like that. So basically, the importance of these pieces are when are these going to occur, these interim analysis. So if you're, you know, if you're designing a trial and you're involved with the clinical operations piece or, or the boss upstairs, the CEO wants to know, when is this going to happen? When am I going to have to pay for certain things? Because like, there's a lot of money involved with uh, filing NDA submission. Clinical operations wants to know. Um, when should they start doing this? Data management wants to know how much time they have to clean. Um, so kind of predicting when these are going to happen are, are the, is the main focus of this, what I'm going to talk about next. Um, so as I kind of got ahead of myself, so why is it important? So we need to plan DMC meetings. So if you're familiar with your DMC charter, it says your DMC will meet every four months or every X number of events. Um, so it helps to you know plan in advance, as you can imagine, trying to plan you know, a series of very busy MDs and statisticians and c companies, you can't really just say, hey, are you free next week? You, got, you have to plan you know, sometimes four to six months in advance um, to get these, these uh, DMCs on the books. So that's one reason. The big one's kind of the internal piece, and that's how much time do we have to clean the data? How much time do we have to get prepared if the things look good and we can refile with the FDA, how much time do we have? And the other piece is this adjudication piece, and uh, I'll get into this later on, but when a, when a serious adverse ag event comes in, it has to get evaluated if it meets certain criteria. It has to go through this thing that I mentioned earlier called virtual uh, adjudication system to really determine if that event is what it is, and that takes time. Um, so knowing when these events are going to happen uh, helps plan on how fast does this group who's going to adjudicate things really need to, really need to work. Um, so kind of what we did is we had four kind of methods to kind of predict when these interim analysis were going to happen. In particular, the first one or two interim analysis were really key to try to be able to predict. So we tried three or four different, different uh, Approaches. So the first approach is if you design the study in EAST, it's all you know already in your system. There's a nice little drop-down graph that says under the null hypothesis, so there's two treatment groups here. Here's when you're going to have a total number of events. So we have aggregate. We're always looking at aggregate, aggregate events. Um, so we would use this, say, hey, at year, I can't really see it, but it's year one, one after the first patient is randomized, you're probably gonna have your, if this is your point where you wanna know when that's gonna happen. So EAST is a nice tool to use right off the bat because your study's designed that way. Um, it takes into account, obviously, your assumptions, what your event rate was, your MACE event rate was, what your dropout was, what your accruement rate was. Um, if your study is different from that, then you might have to go back in and kind of use tweak your initial study design to kind of use EAST again to kind of predict 
when these events are going to happen. But it's a nice, easy tool, and it makes a nice uh, graph. And the clinicians, you know, love seeing these kind of things, and you can kind of customize them um, as you need fit. But it's one way. If your study's already in East, use the tool that's already in East. Um, so the one thing that we couldn't do in this is the, the, the compound, this particular compound had some unique characteristics. Um, when you use EAST, it kind of assumes that your treatment effect is constant the whole way, that a subject, if they're randomized to one group, they have that risk their whole, their whole experience, where that's not always, that wasn't the case for this particular compound. And what I mean by that is when the subject is on the treatment, they're at risk of one of these major cardiovascular events, whether they're on placebo or, or they're on active, they're at risk. When they come off the treatment, whether it's placebo or it's the real active drug, you in th the assumption is that after they're off the drug for a while, that risk goes away. Um, so they become essentially placebo versus placebo patients after a time. So we had to build in that fact that we had to take into account subjects coming off the study and losing that risk. Because when you lose the risk, you're not going to see events as fast as you did before. So you kind of have to adjust that. So what we did was we wrote a simulation. Um, and I just threw some screenshots. There's no formulas or setup or anything. So I'll just kind of explain why we had to do a simulation. So this particular drug it's a drug for weight loss. Um, when you take the drug initially in the first few first month or so, there's some tolerability issues. Um, it's public knowledge if you look. It's, there's diarrhea, constipation, uh, nausea, things like that. So subjects who are taking the drug for weight loss, they tend to if, if they don't they have you know they tend to drop out during the four, uh, first, 14, uh, uh, first uh, four months, and then if they make it through that period, they tend to kind of drop off in like kind of an exponential rate because um, unlike a drug that you have to take for your, to, you know, for your life, for your, for to, to live, weight loss is a little bit different. I mean, everyone probably knows that if, if you take a drug that's helping you lose weight, in theory, that should help your, your life. But you can stop taking the drug um, and you probably will stop losing weight. But, you, you know, typically it's not the same type of treatment effect as a normal drug that you need, uh, you need to uh, for uh, another type of medical condition. So what we had to do is we had to model subjects dropping off of treatment, and then once they drop off, changing that particular subject's risk. Um, so while they're on treatment, they have a risk. And then once they're off treatment, they lose that risk. Um, so we, we gauge the risk on when they were on and off treatment. So it's very interesting that, so in a normal simulation, everyone kind of uses exponential to kind of simulate, you know, time to type of events. So you can simulate how long a, a patient stays on drug by just using a simple exponential like decay curve on how long they're going to stay on, a, on, on the treatment. This particular study, at the, at the four-month point, if a subject hadn't achieved a certain weight loss, they were automatically removed from treatment. Basically, if the, if the patient wasn't losing weight, it wasn't beneficial for them to be on the, the, the treatment any longer, so we, so we took them off. Um, so basically, that's kind of this dip right here. So then what we started doing is we started modeling like a three-phase exponential where this first is when patients drop off for tolerability in this kind of phase, and then they drop off at the four-month mark. They're forced to drop off. Both placebo patients and active patients, we don't know who they are, but if they don't meet our weight loss criteria, they, they no longer can get treatment. And then after here is kind of another exponential. So basically what we did was we simulated that three-phase exponential and then we just built in a group sequential study design to see how the risk, so once a subject kind of comes off treatment, so on this line represents off treatment. So if a subject comes off here, their time post that, they had a different risk than they were, than they were on treatment. So your events would come later on because there wouldn't be as much risk. Um, so this is in R. So I'm going to give a plug for every software I use. Um, this is R. This is R. 
So we wrote a little simulation um, that would simulate the trial like a million times or whatever, and it would go through the whole group sequential, group sequential study, and we could change aspects of the risk, whether you know we could simulate it kind of like East does, where the patient maintains the risk whether they're on or off drugs. We could control that scenario, but if we thought all oh, the risk changes by half, we could model that in. So basically, up here you can't really see all the meta-analysis, but these are all like very similar to East. They're readouts on like what's the probability you stop for non-inferiority, what's the power, and all that. So it's just a bunch of meta-analysis, meta-analysis pieces. Um, remaining on study or off study. It's Correct. Nothing to do with e efficacy. efficacy. Just off treatment, on treatment. Yeah. So the first one is like if you were going to do a simple exponential, but then we we actually simulated a three-phase exponential. The dashed one is actually the Kaplan-Meier curve. This is actual real data. So what we would do is we would run this simulation. It was always a learning simulation. So we'd collect data. We would run the simulation and we would estimate the parameters of this three-phase three exponential based on the actual real data, and then we would simulate it again. So, we were, so we'd collect data, simulate the three-phase curve based on the Kaplan-Meier data. Then a month later, we would do it again. We would do it again. Um, so we'd simulate a lot, and every time we would kind of get some pictures over here, and this, like I said, the meta-analysis you can't see, but this row says like the for this particular study, the 87th event was the first uh, interim analysis, the, the administrative one. So the first line says the 87th event will occur on January 14th, such and such. So we would do that to kind of to kind of gauge when they would happen. Then this second row is like the second interim analysis, the third, the fourth, a bunch of stats on non-inferiority and power and things like that. And this is a bunch of... This is all the inputs that went into it. So it's just a very customized simulation where we could simulate treatment, event rate, en enrollment rate. We could actually simulate the enrollment rate, but once the study was enrolled, um, we kind of sometimes used the actual enrollment rate data instead of simulated it. We just used, used yeah. that. Yep, go ahead. So uh, in, the, in the beginning part, uh, everyone's on study. Yeah. Uh, so the, the treatment effect, there's, a, there's some some hazard ratio, yep. then when it drops, what ha uh, in your model, then the hazard ratio becomes one? Yes. So yeah, basically, yeah, exactly. In your simulation model. Yeah. And, then, and what is the, uh, it, uh, it picks up again? Picks so these are, uh, no, these what, are. What is the third piece? The, the dashed? Yeah, that one. So we, so, okay, so we simu when we simulated, uh, so we had to, in order to simulate, we had to simulate the patient's experience, how long they were going to be on the, the drug. So in order to simulate their time on drug, we would simulate it using a three-phase exponential curve. Yeah. That The parameters of the exponential were derived from the actual Kaplan-Meier for the data. So we would, That's the Kaplan-Meier of that's the, the probability of being on. Yeah, that's the actual real data I would derive the lambda parameters for the three phase exponential. Then I would use that to simulate. And then I would do, and then a month later, I would get a new Kaplan Meyer, I would get new lambdas, and I would re simulate. So I was always updating the simulation to mimic what I was seeing in the data. And, and, and you, but that's independent of the treatment effect. The, the treatment effect is uh, a, 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 yeah, different, correct. a different set of assumptions. Correct. Yeah, so basically I would, I would generate, we would generate like a patient's experience on drug, and if they were on the treatment group, they would have some, some um, risk. And then there was caveats on, on, they couldn't have, if they were off, I'm trying to, they should, basically once they came off treatment in the simulation, we, we created a different risk for, for them. Yeah. yeah. So, so in this one, at 26 weeks, at six months, half, half of the treatment, Correct. Correct. So you can see that, yeah, so like that, that's the problem that we run into. Unlike the, the you know, like the, the EAST model assumes that you have treatment effect constant, where here we know that if half the people are on off the drug, 
after four months, a year from now, you have a lot of people who are off drug. You're looking at kind of, uh, even if there was a treatment effect, you're kind of like dealing with placebo versus placebo patients at that time because they've been off the drug for six months. Um, so we kind of thought we could model that by having the ability to change the risk. We don't know what the risk was, so we would kind of just change the risk. So there's no information in there about whether they were successful or they made it. No, this has nothing. Yeah, no nothing. Yeah. Yeah, the only piece that had to do with weight is is whether they were they were discontinued. In the simulation, yeah. So in the simulation, we would discontinue them based on this pattern. Yeah. And we would re update the simulation based on real data. Then we'd update the sim. So this was always this three phase exponential always would got closer and closer to mimicking the real the real data. And then we would simulate. And if they discontinued later, versus if they discontinued earlier, did you model the treatment effect differently? Um, no, we basically, if they were on the drug, we had, they had one risk. one risk. Once they came off, we gave them a little buffer. Like we would change even the buffer. They, they, they have the risk until 30 days after they're off treatment, then their risk goes away. Yeah, so there's actually a little parameter up there that shows this little off treatment buffer. So it got a little, just because of the nature of the, of the risk, we were trying to try to get a better gauge on when we thought these events um, would happen. So that was a, a, an R simulation that was kind of always living. Yes, yeah. It does, yeah. So we would use that in the dropout piece to mimic it, yeah. We, What, so I, I, let me go back to that. The piecewise, this isn't the dropout. This is off drug. So there's two. There's two in this simulation. There's a patient gets numerous characteristics. They have a, they have a dropout, which is a different than this is whether they're. This is just an example of whether they're on or off treatment, not whether they're in the study or not. Like the dropout. So slightly different. So like I think in East is the piecewise for dropout. Okay. Okay. So the other method that, that we kind of looked at um, was a method where, again, using the aggregate real data, this is kind of a two-part process, was we would, at a certain point in time, we would know how many um, subjects had a mace. Since mace is the primary endpoint, how many subjects had a mace, then there was events that were in this VCAS system. These were the events that got pushed into the system to be adjudicated. So we knew how many were in there. So I call those sus S mace, suspected mace. And then we had metrics. And I'll, I'll explain on the next slide what the metrics were. The metrics were what was the statistics on when events came into the system, how did, how did they get adjudicated? Depending on how they came in, how did they get adjudicated? If they came in as a, as a heart, as a, a heart attack, did they get adjudicated as a heart attack or did they get adjudicated as this, per, you know, as heartburn? Um, so we had statistics. So what we would do is we would, we would kind of take into account how many known mace we had, this pipeline that we had, and some conversion statistics to estimate how many, how many mace we thought there might be at a given time. Then we used some um, follow-up time and observed mace rate and dropout rate to estimate kind of the trajectory of mace over time. I'll kind of go my two, uh, so I just kind of want to walk through this process. If you've been in a study like this, it's very, very complex on uh, the collection of SAEs. Um, so I kind of wanted to show you two paths, because uh, on a couple slides later, there's some graphs. So just take your typical, most folks are familiar with CRF collection of SAEs. So this is no different. The site enters an SAE. And in this particular study, there was kind of four SAEs that were of importance. Is, it, is this a death? Is it a stroke? Is it a heart attack? Or is it a HUSA? If it is, then this is, what, this is, in, this is a suspect mace. So this, is gonna go, this, this event's going to get pushed into Argus or your safety database. Some safety MD looks at the SAE that gets pushed in, and he makes or she makes a decision. Was this a mistake? If it wasn't a mistake, this SAE gets pushed into this virtual adjudication system. So this virtual adjudication is a third-party 
organization that adjudicates events. So they, they see the events come in, they make a decision if this SAE is in fact a heart attack, is in fact, is in fact a death. Um, so it goes in, they collect all of this information. So it takes about two to three months. Once this event gets in, it takes a long time to collect all the information um, from the hospitals, from you know, death certificates and things like that. So this is basically the main route. Things come in from the site. It is a legitimate SAE that's one of these categories and it gets adjudicated. The other path is kind of over here. I'll kind of skip of this, but there were serious adverse events that had preferred terms that we were interested in. So basically on a weekly basis, we would scan the, the safety database after you know the safety data was coded to preferred terms. We had about 2,000 preferred terms that we were looking for. And if we ever had an SAE that hit on one of those preferred terms, then we would, we would notify the site that we think you need to look into this event. Um, so this is the targeted medical query. So we would run that, and if we would get a hit on the targeted medical query, then it would push it into the system. And then it would go into adjudication. Here's probably where my 95%, I think I'm missing some arrows, but I was running out of space. Um, so those are kind of the two main routes. It comes from the site like you're used to. This was us scouring the database looking for certain preferred terms. And if they hit the list, then we wanted to, to um, have them adjudicate. So basically, here's what would come out of this. So basically, on the left is just a little graphic that would show these are SAEs that were fully adjudicated that came from the site. So these are categories that, they're initial, that they initially get pushed into the system as. So for instance, at this particular cut, there were 24 deaths reported. Of those 24 deaths, 19 actually turned out to be real deaths. Because sometimes deaths get pushed in, but the person didn't really die. It, it happened. It ha it He's happened. mostly dead. He's mostly dead. I will say that at, we had a situation where I had, I had a patient who unfortunately died twice. <laughs> they died at like 10.30 p.m. on a Thursday. They had a death certificate. They were revived after midnight. They're now alive. Then they died again. And they have two death certificates. So you do have interesting cases where we couldn't, convince the, we couldn't convince the FDA that not only does this make you lose weight, but it will bring you back from the dead. I don't think you're going to get that no. on the label. We, they, they took it out at the 11th hour. So, so basically, these are kind of how events get pushed in. So basically, if a death comes in, it gets fully adjudicated as a MACE. Remember, MACE is a heart attack, a stroke, or a CV-related death. So this obviously probably came as a death and got adjudicated to a CV death. These were probably either not deaths or not CV related deaths. So that's why they're not red. Um, you know, some um, uh, MIs come in. This is kind of the hit rate. Um, unstable angina is a condition. Some of them, a lot of them came in from the site, but only five of them turned out to actually be mace. Most of them get pushed over. The site thinks it's a, a, a HUSA, but they, after adjudication, they said, no, it's not really a hospitalization for unstable angina. It's actually a stroke. So they get recoded. So these are their initial, their initial entry into the system. And whether they hit is kind of um, the red one. So basically, the whole point of this is, what's kind of your hit rate when something comes into the system? Um, how likely is it that it's going to yield a mace? So if something comes in from the site, as a death, you got about an 80% chance that that's probably going to be a legit mace. Um, contradict that over here, too. These are events that come in with on the hit list, so to speak. So notice um, this is acute coronary syndrome. We had 107 at this particular juncture. SAEs get pushed into the system because they were on the TQM list because they had a preferred term that was acute coronary syndrome. A lot of them, but only five of them actually turned out to be a mace. So they must have got reclassified as a stroke or, a, or an MI or whatever. So some things get pushed in on by the targeted medical query, and they, turned out to, they turn out to be something. So 
a low yield, but you still get a few, you know, you still get maces. And when you're dealing with, you know, studies where, uh, you know, mace is time and, and planning, even the low yield here is um, important. The other piece that's really important is the DMC and the FDA make, wanted to make sure that you were going through every possible method to try to make sure in this big of a study that you are capturing, you know, the cardiac risk for, for these patients. So don't just rely on the site reporting them. Proactively scan the data to look for lists, look for terms, and then push those. So this is kind of a two-way approach to try to, you know, you know, make sure that you're exhausting all effort. Um, so basically, what the method is going to do is it's going to take into account these conversions to kind of help predict how much the pipeline is going to yield. So I'll kind of speed up through this. I probably So here's just a restatement of the method. So basically, here's the gist of what the slide, the next slide is going to show is at some time t, so this time t is after randomization, you know how many subjects have a mace. And then there's some you're going to add on something to kind of estimate how many, time, how many uh, subjects are going to have a mace at some time from now. And, you know, the pieces that go into it are the number of subjects currently with a mace, the number of subjects you've lost who are gone from the study, the number of subjects who are still at risk to have a mace, and then some mace rate and dropout rate kind of parameters. So these are my two slides um, with formulas. They're actually closed form. It's very simple to implement. Um, and basically, at the end of the day, the thing that I show the, you know, my clinicians and my clinical operations and the CEO is this. So over here is kind of when I would do an interim analysis. Here's, there are 20 events sitting in the pipeline. Right here, my graph here, this is 68, that's 67. So when I did this interim analysis, I knew that there were 67 primary endpoints. There were 67 subjects who had a mace, 67, 67. So I knew also that the VCAS system had a pipeline of 20 events that were sitting in VCAS that had not yet been adjudicated. So basically, using the information from the metrics, I kind of estimated how many I might yield from that. So basically, if something comes in as a death from the site, and I have four of them, and the, you know, the conversion rate is about 77%, I would expect I would get three out of four of those. So this kind of gives me my little, even though I don't know what the answer is, they're sitting there waiting. I'm going to estimate, just to estimate how many I think I could yield. And then I kind of raise my estimate up here. And then those formulas on the previous page are just a little projection. We call this snake with a flashlight. Everyone, every Monday, they're like, Kai, show us the snake with a flashlight. So I show it. And they'd want to know when the state was. You know, when can we expect this, this, this uh, for this particular one was the 87th event. When is that going to happen? Because that's going to happen somewhere. And then it's going to take two months after that to get to the system. So this is the, you know, some subject, unfortunately, is going to have one of these events I'm predicting on this date. And then that event is going to trickle through the system, and it's going to take two months to get adjudicated. So hopefully, by that time, I would have that you know this many events. So I'm kind of trying to predict when this red line is going to cross the 89, 87th event, and then kind of add two months to it. And that's where I want to kind of have the DMC and tell, here's when we're going to have the DMC. Tell the FDA, here's when the truck's arriving on their front door with all the paperwork kind of stuff. Um, Patients, uh, unique patients with an event. So some subjects may have both an MI and then died or something. So a unique patient. So this was kind of the method uh, that we used. And uh, again, we worked with uh, Cytel on some of the modeling here. But basically, you find out how many you have. Use what you know about your conversion rates and your pipeline. And then do some kind of prediction on when you think the, uh, the event uh, what happened. And it actually turned out to be very accurate. I'll say accurate within a, you know, a couple weeks, you know, you're predicting four months out, five months out. That's, that's pretty good when you can say, I, I think it's going to be sometime in the month of November. They seem to be okay with that. 
Any questions there? So it's kind of a neat little, neat little. The thought transfer interval was by simulation or by the Cook's method? Yeah, they're all closed form. There's no simulation. It's just a, so there's like, when you're looking at this direction, that's like a 95% confidence interval up and down for, yeah. Yeah, there's no simulation involved. Everything here is just closed form. Fairly, you know, a couple formulas. You can do it. So this obviously, this comes out of SAS. Got a plug for SAS there. Then I would plug that into R to make my graphic. And then the last method was um, a method called the target 199 method. So what I did is I went to target. <laughs> I got a ruler, and I told my boss, it's going to probably be somewhere right there. So just linear regression. So, <laughs> so after I spent months and months, I just went to Target and got a ruler and said, I think it's going to be around that day. He said, your budget is cut in half. So, so that's pretty much, uh, pretty much it. I have some references.